Hello friends, I've just been exploring Washington DC, but I thought I'd take a break to talk about another Nancy Drew book versus game with you. In this video series, I read the books that the Nancy Drew games were inspired by and report back on them to you, touching on the most important and interesting plot points as well as highlighting the key similarities and differences. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you're interested in more book versus game videos. Okay. Let's talk about Secret of the Scarlet Hand. This is a 6 Nancy Drew game, released in 2002, and the 124th book in the Nancy Drew Mystery Stories series, originally published in 1995. Interestingly, Message in a Haunted Mansion is number 122 in this series, while Treasure in the Royal Tower is number 128, so whoever at Her Interactive picked the games to be adapted must have been interested in this era. Shame we never got a game of number 125, the teen model mystery, or 129, the baby hyphen sitter burglaries. The cover shows Nancy, Bess, and George exclaiming over the titular Scarlet Hand, which, like in the game, looks like a kindergarten craft. That's two steps away from being a Thanksgiving turkey. This image is paired with the tagline, Nancy vows to catch a thief, dot dot dot, red-handed. I'm pretty sure they came up with the tagline and then developed the premise from there. Let's check out the synopsis. Nancy matches wits with a master of a most ancient art, crime. On a trip to the nation's capital with her father, Nancy had planned to do plenty of sightseeing, but it's what she doesn't see that truly sparks her interest. While taking a tour of the Beach Hill Museum, famed for its pre-Columbian art, she discovers that a priceless Mayan artifact, a carving of the ancient king Lord Pakal, has been stolen. The only clue to the disappearance is a note covered with mysterious Mayan symbols. Seeking to decode the message, Nancy realizes that the thief is both clever and elusive. But finding Lord Prakal is imperative. Mexico claims the piece is rightfully theirs, and failure to recover it could lead to an international incident. As you might notice, it sounds pretty similar to the game. The main notable difference in the synopsis is that Carson Drew is with Nancy in DC, and that she's not a deputy curator, just a lowly tourist. I think that change works really well for the game, as it gives Nancy more agency to act without constraint, more power as a direct insider with the museum, and not to mention a more obvious reason for her personally to investigate the crime. But what is the secret of the Scarlet Hand? Well, let's find out. Dear Dad, greetings from the new deputy curator at Beach Hill Museum in Washington, D.C. So this is Beach Hill, Nancy Drew exclaimed. She and her two friends stared in awe at the mansion in front of them. The elegant building was made of red brick and pale stone. The rolling grounds surrounding the house were a lush green. So we already have a difference in the first few sentences on page one. Although Beach Hill Museum in the game is magnificent, it would be quite a stretch to call it a mansion. Bess even worries that she's underdressed to enter the museum because she's wearing a crew neck sweater and a pair of jeans. I don't think Beach Hill in the game has a dress code, but if it did, I think the first bullet point would be no skin colored shirts which make it look like you're naked underneath your lab coat, Henrik. The three girls are in DC because Nancy's dad invited them along on a trip to a legal seminar. Oh boy, I can really see why they jumped at the chance to go on this trip. The director of Beach Hill Museum is Carson Drew's friend, Susan Caldwell. I'm sure you're thinking, hmm, that's not Joanna Riggs, but we'll get to that. Susan greets Nancy. You have to be Nancy Drew, she said with a friendly smile. You look so much like your father. Nancy returned her smile. Except for my hair, she said, gesturing to her shoulder-length reddish blonde hair. Everyone says I get it from my mother's side of the family. Do they? <laughs> I have never heard that before. Susan gives the girls a tour and provides them with some Beach Hill lore at the same time. Beach Hill was originally the home of Samuel and Lavinia Cartwright. They bought the house and land in the 1930s and named it 
beech hill for the old copper beech tree in the main garden. So if you ever wondered why Beach Hill is called Beach Hill, that's why. Susan says that Samuel Cartwright was an ambassador to Mexico, and he began to collect pre-Columbian art through his experience in that position, although other art collectors thought that was a very weird thing to do. They thought these were works by primitive, uneducated people, not art at all, Susan said. They thought it wasn't worth buying. It's a pity it didn't stay that way, a voice with a soft Latino accent spoke up behind them. A sinister and iconic entrance from Alejandro del Rio there. People like the Cartwright stole my country's art, he said bitterly. They locked it away so only rich Americans could see it. Beach Hill is open to the public, Susan protested. Anyone can come here. You know that, Alejandro. It's not that simple, the young man scowled. Is the art of your country thousands of miles away where your people can never see it? He's right and he should say it. If Joanna Riggs or that overstuffed pillowhead Sinclair had any decency, they would take measures to see that all Maya artifacts were returned to Mexico at once where they belong. A gray-haired older man approaches the group wearing thick black magnifying spectacles. It's Mr. Pointy Vanderhead himself, Henrik Vanderhoon. I don't remember Henrik wearing glasses in the game. I guess that explains why he fell down the pyramid. He just couldn't see where he was going. And he probably faked the amnesia to avoid dealing with the embarrassment. Relatable. Hold on, I need to write this down for my next Nancy Drew theory video. Henrik overheard the conversation that Susan and Alejandro were having and says, It was wrong for American collectors to take the art of your country away. To which Susan replies that what's done is done, which is obviously a very problematic attitude. Susan would get cancelled on Twitter so fast. She tells the girls about the museum's latest acquisition, a carving of Lord Bacall. In the book, the carving is not yet on display, so Susan leads the girls to a storage room, which sounds quite similar to the shipping room in the game. Two of the walls were fitted with floor-to-ceiling shelves for holding pottery, sculpture, and other artifacts. There is also a massive storage case with lots of drawers and a long wooden table. Susan crossed to the storage case. She scanned the labels on the drawers, then inserted another key into the tiny lock on one drawer. Pulling it out gently, she reached in and removed a well-worn cardboard gift box, about the size of a deck of cards. Not the most attractive packaging in the world, Susan admitted with a smile, but it serves the purpose. Isn't it hard to believe that something so valuable could be this small? With a flourish, she swept the lid off the box. Here he is, Lord Pakal! The girls crowded around in anticipation, eager to see the priceless carving of the king. But as Susan Caldwell tilted the box for them to see inside, Nancy let out a loud gasp. Aside from some lumpy cotton, the box was empty. Lord Pakal was gone. Who could have predicted this? Wouldn't be disappointing to me, I just love looking at lumpy cotton, yep, can't get enough of that. Susan flew back to the storage drawer and began to poke around inside. She reached her hand deeper into the drawer. When she pulled out her hand again, she was clutching something in her palm. What did you find? Nancy asked. Susan slowly opened her fingers. Lying in her palm was a small square of folded paper. It looks like a note, George said. With trembling fingers, Susan opened the small square. The paper was covered with black, handwritten characters, unlike any Nancy had ever seen before. In the center of the unfolded sheet was an ominous-looking blood-red handprint. Susan pointed to the black characters. These are Mayan glyphs, she said in a dazed voice. Each one stands for a word. Unfortunately, unlike Joanna, Susan doesn't even attempt to translate the glyphs, so we have no idea what they mean. Susan asks for Nancy's help investigating the crime, probably because she knows she can get away with not paying her. That's the only reason I can think of for why a museum director would elect to hire a teenage detective when so much is at stake. 
the museum's reputation, a one-of-a-kind piece of history, Susan's career, you know, just little things like that. Anyway, naturally, Nancy agrees to take the case, else this book would be 13 pages long. Susan tells Nancy that the only people who have keys to the storage room are herself and Henrik. They do actually call the police as well, and the detective assigned to the case, Detective Briscoe, is, well, a condescending asshole. I'd like my friend Nancy Drew to stay, Susan Caldwell told Briscoe. She's a detective. Briscoe glanced at Nancy, a smirk creeping across his face. A detective, he asked? Really? Nancy nodded and smiled politely, trying to hide her annoyance. She was used to police officers thinking that a teenager couldn't do much more than talk on the phone or shop at the mall. I've solved quite a few mysteries back in River Heights, my hometown, she said. Detective Briscoe shrugged. I doubt you've ever been involved in something like this, he said. Nancy simmered as he turned back to question Susan Caldwell. Who did the detective think he was? She had been involved in many cases as serious as this one. I'll teach him the secret of the Scarlet Hand real quick when I slap him across the face. I'm curious as to why Nancy says she's only solved mysteries in River Heights. Just to remind you, this is book number 124 in the Nancy Drew Mystery Stories series. Nancy has been to Greece, France, Africa, and many other locations. I don't know why she picks this moment to be humble. Obviously, Detective Briscoe didn't take her at all seriously. Now she was more determined than ever to work on the case. That's my girl. Detective Briscoe takes the note with the scarlet handprint, and Nancy remarks that he'll probably take it to a lab for chemical analysis. So that's a pivotal piece of evidence that Nancy is in no way involved with in the book. Although it does make more sense for the police to handle it than Nancy, who has never even seen a spectroanalyzer before in her life, let alone used one. Susan shows Nancy a picture of the Pakal carving so she knows what to look for. Lord Pakal had been depicted with a sloping forehead, a strong, straight nose, and full lips. He looks haughty and powerful, Nancy thought, and also vaguely familiar. Where had she seen that face before? A strange and cryptic comment to which we will return to later. Susan and the girls meet with the art dealer who sold the Pakal carving to the museum, a silver-haired man in grey slacks and a navy blue blazer. You might not have realized it, as there is no mention of a horribly offensive tie, but this man is Taylor Sinclair. Sinclair is there to show Susan the provenance documents, which are very similar to the ones in the game, even mentioning the elderly couple who previously owned the carving, and who may or may not have been killed by the culprit. After Taylor leaves, Nancy says to Susan, You mentioned that you knew someone who could decipher the writing on that piece of paper we found in the drawer? Oh yes, John Riggs, Susan said. He's an archaeologist at the Museum of Natural History. So there is no Joanna Riggs in the book, there's only John Riggs who is the expert on glyph translation rather than Henrik. Joanna is basically a fusion of John Riggs and Susan. Nancy leaves Susan and sees Henrik and Sinclair talking in the gardens outside of Beach Hill. Note that these gardens are outside the museum, not within them. Sinclair departs and Nancy approaches Henrik, meaning to interrogate him. Before she could reach him, a movement above his head caught her eye. A stone statue of an armless woman teetered on the wall above Vanderhune. Watch out, Nancy shouted. She raced over to him, but before she could reach him, the statue toppled off the wall and struck the back of Vanderhoon's neck. Not very armless after all, then. <laughs> With a horrible moan, Henrik Vanderhoon pitched forward. He fell down face first, the statue's shattered pieces scattered around him. Between the two inciting incidents to the Henrik Gets Amnesia plotline, I much prefer the drama of him toppling down the pyramid. <laughs> Nancy pulls out an envelope from beneath Henrik's lifeless body, which turns out to contain the provenance documents. 
She also discovers that the iron brackets, which were supposed to hold the statue to the wall, have been unscrewed. Nancy calls Detective Briscoe, and he reveals that the handprint was made from mercuric sulfide. Nancy has an appointment with John Riggs, who, remember, works at the Museum of Natural History. I guess Mrs. Caldwell told you about the theft of Lord Pakal, Nancy began. John Riggs leaned back in his chair and put his feet up on his desk. It's a shame, isn't it? He said in a cheerful voice. They spent so much money for it. If this museum had bought it, it would be here now, safe. It also would have been seen by many more people if it were here. I kind of wish this subplot of two rival museums had been in the game. It would make for a lot of entertaining banter and an easy additional suspect. Riggs begins translating the glyphs. The message is not pleasant. It threatens anyone who tries to find the carving with death by dismemberment. <laughs> dismemberment, Bess cried? Doesn't that mean chopping off arms and legs? Nancy nodded. I'm afraid so. Would have been fun to see that as a second chance. Additionally, Riggs explains that mercuric sulfide is also known as cinnabar, which was used by the Maya to accentuate lines in their carvings, such as the Pakal carving. Nancy looked intently at Lord Pakal's face again. Suddenly it came to her, the person whom he reminded her of. At that moment, Nancy heard the shuffle of someone's feet in the doorway behind her. She turned and saw the man whose face she'd just been thinking about. Alejandro Del Rio! Yes, the implication is that Alejandro Del Rio is a long-lost descendant of Pakal. I'm gonna be honest here, I don't see the resemblance. Alejandro spots Nancy and immediately turns around and leaves, which is, frankly, a hilarious reaction to seeing Nancy Drew. Nancy, Bess, and George follow Alejandro across DC to the Jefferson Memorial. He talks to a mysterious hooded man and leaves. But then, the hooded man tries to run Nancy over with a bicycle and also steal the provenance documents, although he succeeds at neither. Out of all the different modes of transportation that exist, a bicycle has got to be one of the least threatening to try to run someone over with. Like, you could probably just tip it over. The trio return to Beach Hill, and Susan tells them that Henrik has amnesia. I was gonna make a joke about this, but I forget what it was. When Nancy asks Susan about Cinnabar, Susan gives her the number for a chemical warehouse. Nancy phones them up and discovers that a rush order for Cinnabar was placed just last week by John Riggs, who earlier told Nancy that he didn't have any. Back at their hotel, the girls find that their room has been ransacked. This would have been a really cool thing to happen in the game, as you go back and forth between the hotel and the game's other locations with a growing sense of complacency, and something unexpected like this occurring would really up the dramatic tension. Especially as Nancy finds another note with a scarlet handprint and Mayan glyphs on it in their room. The game often feels like a dry slog in which you are being forced at gunpoint to learn about Mayan history, although without the inherent threat and excitement of being held at gunpoint. Beach Hill? More like give me the beach will to live, am I right? <laughs> Feeling directly threatened like this would make the game a lot more thrilling, not to mention create a sense of urgency more effective than the threat of Joanna being fired. Why the f would I care about Joanna? I've only known her for two days, and every time I try to ask her for help, she's useless. Do you think Alejandro would go to extreme measures, like stealing, to reclaim Mexico's artifacts? Who knows? What were their initial findings? Who knows? I'm curious about the red handprint the thief left. Does it have any significance in Maya culture? Afraid I can't help you there. I haven't seen Henrik since the theft. Where do you think he could be? Who knows? Carson Drew returns to the hotel room and upon hearing about the break-in, says this. My guess is that somebody out there wants you to stay out of this business. Whoever it is is serious. His next words hung in the air. Dead serious. Okay, cut out the amateur dramatics, Carson. Be chill. That night, Nancy has a dream. In her dream, she sees... 
a strange-looking plumed bird soaring above the tidal basin. It dipped down to peck at a terrifying black jaguar. They writhed together in a smoky haze as bells rang shrilly in the distance. Now, I did some dream interpretation on Nancy's behalf, and according to psychologist world, it is a favorable dream to see birds of beautiful plumage. A wealthy and happy partner is near if a woman has dreams of this nature. God, I hope this means Nancy is finally going to find a replacement for Ned. To see flying birds is a sign of prosperity to the dreamer. All disagreeable environments will vanish before the wave of prospective good. I literally have no idea what that means, but cool. Then I tried to look up what smoke means in a dream, but I was told that I would have to sign up for a member account to access smoke dreams. As tempting as self-hypnosis mp3 downloads sound, I'm not invested enough in Nancy's dream to give Psychologist World my email address. We shall see if these omens come to pass in the remaining hundred pages of the book. Suddenly, Nancy awoke and realized the bell she'd heard in her dream was the phone beside her bed. She groped for the receiver. Hello, she murmured, still half asleep. Nancy drew. A softly accented voice whispered. Yes, she replied. Would you like to know more about Lord Pakal? Then listen to the audio narration connected to his exhibit. No, what they really say is that Nancy needs to ask John Riggs, and then they hang up. So the next day, Nancy goes to see John Riggs, and also gets him to translate the latest Scarlet Hand note. Whoever left this note wants you to stop looking for the carving, he said. It says your skin will be flayed, and your intestines pulled out if you continue the investigation. A chill ran up Nancy's spine. Oh, is that all? She commented dryly. Cool. That's cool. When Nancy tries to interrogate Riggs like the mysterious caller suggested, Riggs says he has to make a phone call, and he asks Nancy to come back in ten minutes. However, when Nancy returns, Riggs is gone, the only clues to his whereabouts being a note on his desk that says 7pm tonight and lists an address in suburban Maryland. Maryland? Ma Maryland? Americans, help me out here. Hope you're all familiar with train safety because this book is about to go completely off the rails. Nancy, Bess, and George drive into the depths of suburban Maryland to find the address from Briggs's office, where there appears to be a party happening. The girls watch people enter the house from some nearby bushes. Soon, an older woman dressed in dark pants and a matching jacket walked up to the door and was led into the house. As the front door opened, Nancy peered into the front hall. The woman stepped inside, stopping to pick up what looked like a folded burlap robe from a small table. She pulled it over her head, then donned an odd feathered mask. That's so weird, George whispered. Is this a costume party, or what? As the girls watched, each person who entered did the same thing. For some reason, the feathered masks reminded Nancy of her weird dream the night before. What kind of party was this? Put on your rain hat, Nancy. You've got a big storm coming. Nancy asked Bess and George to go write down all the license plate numbers from the cars parked close to the house, and while they're gone, she realizes that she could easily enter the party herself, and does so. Without telling Bess and George, which I'm sure we can all agree, is a great idea. Nancy puts on her own robe and feathered mask and enters a room which has a small table which resembles an altar. Suddenly the room went silent. Nancy heard primitive sounding drums. Hmm, I don't like that adjective. And a strange flute-like refrain. As she watched, all heads turned toward an arched doorway. A procession of robed participants, some with ornately painted faces, marched single file into the room. They were all beating on skin-covered drums or playing clay pipes. Bringing up the rear was a tall man in a feathered costume. His intricately beaded headpiece completely covered his face and head. In front of him, he carried an enormous patterned pottery vessel. The procession cut through the middle of the room, heading toward the altar by the window. As the feathered man reached to the altar, he held the vessel up above his head. His sleeves fell back, and Nancy noticed his skinny forearms were covered with freckles. 
As the music grew louder, the people in the room began to chant. Nancy's mask slipped for a moment as she tried to join the chant, and her fingers fumbled as she tried to put it back in place. The masked man next to her turned and looked straight at her when her mask fell. For all I know, she thought nervously, he could be John Riggs. The chanting continued as trays of large goblets were brought up to the altar. The feathered man began to scoop a liquid from the larger vessel into each cup, then pass them out. Suddenly a cup appeared in front of Nancy. It was held by a cloaked figure wearing an intricately carved green stone ring on one finger. Nancy took the cup and pretended to drink, knowing it was never smart to drink an unidentified liquid. But as she raised the cup to her lips, the man next to her turned abruptly, knocking her arm hard with his elbow. The drink splashed into Nancy's mouth before she could do anything to stop it. Why was her mouth open? It tasted like nothing more than heavily sweetened hot chocolate. She hoped that was what it was. Nancy suddenly remembered that her sweatshirt had a pouch in front. She discreetly reached into the neck of the robe and tucked the goblet into the pouch. Maybe she could get Briscoe to figure out what the liquid was. The chanting continued, and so did the steady drumbeat. Nancy felt herself swaying in rhythm to the music as the room grew hotter and smokier. A man in spotted fur began to dance, looking like half man, half jaguar. Then, as Nancy gazed around the room at the flickering candles, the tiny lights began to swirl around and around. She felt her legs buckle, then give way. A hand reached out to stop her. On one finger was a familiar ring. Greenstone, she thought. Then everything went black. Drugs? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. Stunningly, her interactive didn't include a scene in the game where Nancy is drugged at a cult ritual. I'm pretty sure I don't need to elaborate on why they might have decided to exclude that detail. The next thing Nancy knew, she was lying in the dark on a cold cement floor. She tried to move her arms, but her hands seemed to be bound behind her. A cloth had been tied around her head to gag her mouth. How had she gotten here? She remembered accidentally drinking the strange potion at the ceremony, then getting caught up in the chanting and dancing. I must have passed out, she realized. What was in that cup? With a crash, the door swung open. Moonlight streamed in, silhouetting a dark figure. She couldn't see who it was, but from his build, she knew it was a man. Nancy watched in horror as the man picked up a shovel, hoisted it above his head, and moved toward her. She stiffened and closed her eyes as he began to bring it down on her. Add another item to the list of things her interactive deprived us of while they were adapting Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Attempted shovel murder. Then suddenly, the shovel clattered to the ground and her attacker collapsed. Another man had tackled him, and now the two were rolling in the doorway, grappling fiercely. Nancy caught a quick glimpse of a face. Alejandro Del Rio! But it was so dark she wasn't sure of anything. Was he the one who had tried to attack her, or the one coming to her rescue? Finally, one man broke free and dashed for that open door. Slowly, the other man rose to his feet. Nancy pulled back as he bent over her. It was Alejandro. Alejandro unties Nancy just as Bess and George run up. They were apparently looking for Nancy this whole time. I personally would have called the police if my friend went into a strange house in which everyone was wearing masks and robes and my friend then didn't come out. Bess recognized the man who attempted to shovel murder Nancy as the same man who tried to run her over with his bike. Alejandro reveals that this man is one of the most notorious art smugglers in Mexico, Ricardo Martinez. Martinez had contacted Alejandro and told him that he had some information to share about the theft of the Pakal carving. But apparently all that information amounted to is that the thief is someone Alejandro knows well. Nancy describes the ritual she witnessed to Alejandro. It sounds like the ceremony of the vision serpent, he said. It's one of the most ancient Mayan rituals. The Maya believed it summoned visions from the world of the spirits. My mind immediately went back to Nancy's dream. Don't you think this book would have been 
just that little bit more interesting if Nancy had had the dream after she'd been drugged at the ceremony. I feel that would have been a logical sequence of events, but I don't think this book cares much about logic. The next day, Nancy decides she wants to return to the house where the ritual took place. Bess sighed as she climbed in the car. I just hope no one's trying to summon visions from the world of spirits again. <laughs> When they arrive at the large, Tudor-style house, a pleasant-looking middle-aged woman opens the door. Nancy lies and claims she forgot her jacket at the ceremony and uses the excuse to subtly mine the woman for information. The woman says, Wasn't that a wonderful ceremony last night? Yes, Nancy replied cautiously, very authentic. It really is the highlight of the pre-Columbian society's year, the woman added. The girls traded glances behind the woman's back. The pre-Columbian society? Was that some of, sort of art collector's group? Or a Mayan cult? I mean, it could be both. What was that beverage we drank last night? Oh, that, the woman laughed. Hot cocoa mix, straight out of the box. It's not authentic, but it is quick. So all you need to host a Mayan ceremony at home is a few friends, some sacks people can wear as robes, some masks with feathers stuck to them, a tub of hot chocolate powder, and some sedatives in case any cheeky rabble-rousers decide to gatecrash your exclusive cult party. The woman also lets it slip that it was John Riggs who led the ceremony. Again, Nancy goes to confront Riggs, and this time he breaks down and confesses. I don't like it to be known that I lead those ceremonies for the society, he said. She watched his freckled face turned red. It's a group of amateurs, ordinary people interested in the Maya. Scholars and serious art collectors think it's silly, but I enjoy it, he added defensively. So it's a group of wealthy white people who pay to pretend they're ancient Mayans for an evening. Really putting the cult into cultural appropriation. Nancy notices that Riggs has all the tools he would need to create the scarlet hand letters out on his desk, including a bottle of cinnabar. I thought you said you had no cinnabar, she said. Huh? Riggs looked over his shoulder at the table. Oh, those things. They just showed up the other day. I thought maybe a student had borrowed them and was finally returning them. Real, that was my cousin energy. Riggs then denies ever ordering any cinnabar from the chemical house. The girls leave Riggs and Nancy declares, I'd like to visit Henrik Vanderhune. Somehow, I think he holds the key to this mystery, a line which her interactive took very literally. According to your notes, Pakal made a six-part key to the Whisperer's tomb and scattered the pieces around the world. Do you remember anything about this? Six keys? Six keys? Six keys! Nancy, what are the four corners of the world? North, south, east, and west. Plus the first king, Pakal himself, and the Copan fool. When they're all assembled, they open the tomb. Don't you see? This is why I stole the Pakal, to prevent some other schemer from putting the key together. Nancy's conversation with Henrik can mostly be summed up as... I can't remember. But Henrik does mention that he thinks something was off with the provenance documents. Nancy and the other two girls return to the museum, and Nancy asks to see the Pakal carving's provenance documents, but when Susan looks for them, they're gone. They didn't think to up their security after the last theft? You know, the theft of the unique, irreplaceable piece of Mayan art that they went to such great lengths to acquire? That theft? Anyway, luckily Taylor Sinclair has copies of the provenance documents, so Nancy and co. head over to his office. Sinclair claims he doesn't know where the copies of the provenance documents are and dismisses Nancy, but she manages to finagle copies out of his assistant, Jim Nelson, a name which Nancy thinks seemed familiar for some reason. This isn't going to be another Alejandro situation, is it? Jim Nelson. Isn't that a name of a famous Mayan ruler? As the girls leave, Nancy says in reference to Sinclair, I think we should add him to our list of suspects. Only now? He wasn't on your suspect list before? 
Nancy, he's one of the, like, only four people you've met in the course of this investigation, and you didn't consider him a suspect? Sometimes I think Nancy isn't a very good detective, but then I suppress those thoughts, afraid of the implications they might have, both for myself and for the fandom as a whole. We quickly learn why Jim Nelson's name sounds familiar, and it's not because he shares a name with a famous Mayan figure. He was listed on the printout of car owners from the cult party, and we discover he owns the P.O. box to which the Cinnabar was shipped in John Riggs' name. Riggs also randomly decides that now is a good time to share all the gossip he knows about Sinclair. He has money problems, he's an excellent artist, and he knows even more about Mayan glyphs than Riggs himself. Nancy also suddenly realizes what was off about the provenance documents. The Bill of Sale, which is from 1955, lists the previous owner's postal code. But there were no postal codes in 1955. Nancy's renewed my faith in her with that bit of detective work. The next day, the gang go visit Henrik, who miraculously has regained his memory as soon as it was convenient to the plot. There's an interesting diversion from the story here, which I assume her interactive didn't commit to as it's a bit complicated. So the elderly couple named in the provenance documents did actually own a carving of King Pakal, but when Henrik checked the catalogue of their collection, the one they owned was a vastly inferior quality to the one that turns up at Beach Hill. Henrik confronted Sinclair, and we know how that went for him. <laughs> Nancy returns to Sinclair's gallery and almost immediately threatens Jim Nelson, telling him that he's an accessory to Sinclair's crimes. Jim Nelson confesses that he lent Sinclair his car the night of the cult party. Nancy also notices the green stone ring that she remembers the person who handed her the goblet of hot chocolate was wearing at the party, and surmises that it must have been Sinclair who drugged her drink. As they're leaving, who should enter the gallery but Martinez, the smuggler? They chase after him and Nancy tackles him to the ground. Martinez then reveals the story behind the carving. I found the carving of Lord Pacal in Mexico sometime last year. A peasant brought it to me, Martinez went on. The guy said he saw it on a table of junk at a marketplace near the ruins of Palenque. It looked interesting and very old. I knew it was worth something, so I mentioned it to someone who would know for sure. That someone was Sinclair. Sinclair also tried to get Martinez to put the blame on Riggs, which explains the phone call Nancy got. However, he denies wrecking Nancy's hotel room. Tell us about that night at the house in Maryland, Nancy asked. I saw Sinclair putting you into the shed. I argued with him. I told him he was going too far, but he told me if I wanted my money, I would have to put you out of the detective business permanently. I mean, Sinclair had the opportunity to do that himself. He could have just slipped some poison into Nancy's hot chocolate at the cult ceremony, but that's not how Sinclair works. He wants his hands to be clean. Except when he's painting them with red paint to make the scarlet handprints. Nancy discovers that Sinclair is heading to the airport, so they follow him there. How charming, Taylor purred when he saw Nancy. You've come to see me off. I've come to accuse you of stealing the carving of Lord Pakal, Nancy corrected him. In the book's version of events, Sinclair stole the Pakal carving. So Nancy searches his bag, but doesn't find it. Wearing jeans and cowboy boots, Taylor Sinclair walked away casually, as if he were an ordinary tourist about to spend a few days in New York. Then it dawned on her. Cowboy boots? What an odd choice for Sinclair. She'd never seen him in anything less formal than well-polished black tassel loafers. Oh my gosh, she thought. What better place to hide something small than the large heel of a cowboy boot? Yeah, he sure is a large heel. Nancy runs after Sinclair and tackles him. Honestly, Nancy should have been a football player. Take off your boots, Nancy ordered Sinclair. That's a little unnecessary, isn't it? If you won't take them off, I will, Alejandro threatened him. Let's compare and contrast for a moment. Game. Nancy is trapped inside an 
ancient Mayan monument with a centuries-old corpse and the terrifying knowledge of her impending death by suffocation. Book! Nancy chases a man wearing cowboy boots through an airport yelling, Take off your shoes! Incredibly, the Pakal carving is exactly where Nancy predicted it would be in the heel of Sinclair's boot. After Detective Briscoe, who is by now completely submissive to Nancy, arrives at the airport, they interrogate Sinclair. He was the one who burglarized Nancy's room, and yes, the one who drugged her at the cult party. When I spotted you at the party, I decided to get you out of the way. I found some prescription sedatives in our hostess's medicine chest. In doing research for this video, I discovered something interesting. Apparently, cinnabar was used as a sedative in China for thousands of years. Wouldn't that have been a more thematically appropriate way to sedate Nancy than with a rich white woman's supply of Xanax? Sorry that this video has evolved from being just me comparing The Secret of the Scarlet Hand book and the game to me just critiquing the book. I just can't help it, it's the English student in me. Anyway, Sinclair is taken away in handcuffs, and a few days later Beach Hill holds a press conference to announce that the Pakal carving is being returned to Mexico. At the press conference, Alejandro approaches Nancy with a jewelry box. Inside is a greenstone pendant spelling out Nancy's name in Mayan glyphs. Or an approximation of her name, at least. Her dream came true! I think we can call Alejandro a wealthy and happy partner. He's obviously got enough disposable income that he can buy Nancy a custom-carved pendant, and he's definitely happy about the Pakal carving being returned to Mexico. But what about the other part of Nancy's dream prediction? That all disagreeable environments will vanish before the wave of prospective good. I'm still not quite sure how to interpret that, but Nancy's leaving Beach Hill, so she's rid of that disagreeable environment, I guess. And the disagreeable environment that is the general proximity of Taylor Sinclair. Dear Dad, it was great to talk to you on the phone last night. I can't wait to see you back in River Heights where I can fill you in on the whole story. Can you believe that your own daughter was recently standing face to face with a real mummy? If you've watched my other book versus game videos, you might have noticed a few trends also present in this adaptation. The reduction and conflation of characters, the focus on one central location where most of the action takes place, and the addition of more puzzle-like elements. For example, I can see why they got rid of Carson for the game, as his presence in the book is a little emasculating for his image. Nancy does something like infiltrate a cult ritual and get drugged, and Carson just limply says something like, Don't do that again, young lady! And we all know that Nancy will do something like that again, even within the course of this book. His parental authority is so ineffective it's embarrassing. The monolith is a feature created just for the game, which both provides more action and activities in the museum itself, and an intricate chain of puzzles to occupy the player. The educational factor is more greatly emphasized in the game, again, probably because it gave the developers a lot of opportunities for puzzles. The book has a greater focus on action and intrigue than the game, which moves at quite a slow pace in comparison. But the bases for many elements in the game are already present in the book, such as the smuggling subplot, the Scarlet Hand Carlin card, and Henrik's amnesia. The decision to have Henrik steal the Pakal carving was a great addition to the game, as it gives an additional layer of complication to a story that could have been quite straightforward. It gives Henrik a specific and vital piece of knowledge only he knows, which makes the moment when his memory returns all that more gratifying and exciting. In this case, I don't think her interactive entirely succeeded with elevating the book's content the way they did with previous book-to-game Nancy Drew adaptations. Although they succeed in giving the plot a lot more focus, they also ended up removing a lot of the excitement that was present in the book. Oh, and you might be wondering whether they ever went anywhere with the idea that Alejandro strongly resembles the Pakal carving. And I can tell you, the answer is no, <laughs> which is just emblematic of the lack of attention to detail in this book. Before I go, I have some words of wisdom to share with you. Semper ubi sabubi!